Good evening, everyone. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 23. A lot of people are familiar with Psalm 23. It's one of the first Psalms that I understood, that I figured out, that I learned how to uh, study. And even in studying for it, I felt like I got a a refresher, if I may. It was like I got reacquainted with a classic. And so for those of you that have maybe known Psalm 23 for a long time, I hope that that's the case for you tonight, that it would be a reacquainting. And then perhaps maybe there's some of you here that have never heard of Psalm 23. I hope that it would be a blessing to you as it's been a blessing to many believers that have ever read it and studied it and pondered over it and figured it out and then lived by it. So much to learn from Psalm 23. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And just by reading it, right, it's encouraging just reading it. That's enough. Let's pray. Bible study's done. Just reading it. I mean, it's just... It's so deep and it's simple. It's simple to understand. It's very transparent. It's a, it's a simple message that God's trying to communicate to us. Psalm 23 is a trust psalm. And so if there's any of you here tonight, you're struggling with trusting in God or your trust has been shaken in God because of whatever circumstance. I'm hoping that Psalm 23 would maybe um, fix that, would maybe restore that that by the end of tonight, you would be encouraged to trust the Lord again, that by the end of tonight, you would be encouraged to continue trusting the Lord, because as believers, that's what we're called to do, right? To trust in the Lord and to continue trusting in Him. And so Psalm 23 is a trust psalm. And really what I want to talk about is fear versus faith. Fear. You know, fear can cripple people. Fear can haunt people. Fear can hold people in bondage. For the Christian, fear can affect our relationship with God. I've seen Christians, because of fear, become extreme, extreme, and go about extreme measures to protect themselves or others. I've seen Christians, because of fear, become recluse, and they stop fellowshipping. I've seen Christians, because of fear, uh, not have any friends because they don't trust Anyone, and really they don't trust God. I've seen Christians, because of fear, walk away from the Lord. I've seen Christians, because of fear, never experience the joy of salvation. Because of fear, they have doubted God's love for them. I've seen Christians, because of fear, that have questioned their salvation, have questioned God's love for them. Fear has, met, has, has led many to believe that maybe they've lost their salvation. I've seen fear cause Christians to always feel like they're never good enough and, and become this works trip type of thing. And because it's a works trip, they trip over the works and they trip or they trip out. And either way, it causes either bondage or obstacles between their relationship with God. I would say that fear would be the polar opposite of faith. More faith will equal less fear. But flip that. More fear equals less faith. And so I'm hoping that tonight all of us here would leave with more faith less fear. And that we would take this message and take it to the people that we know are living in fear and encourage them to read Psalm 23. 
Now understand this. The presence of fear does not mean you have no faith. Fear visits everyone, but make your fear a visitor and not a resident. Hey, from time to time, we're going to be afraid of things. From itsy-bitsy spider to the things that we read on the news, those things can inflict fear. Just thoughts about our children or grandchildren and things that could happen to them out of nowhere can cause us to fear. The state of the church in the United States can cause us to fear. The state of the Christian in the United States today can cause us to fear. Uh, Spiritual warfare can cause us to fear. There's a lot of things that can cause us to fear, but what Max Lucado is saying is, let fear be a visitor, not a resident. We'll be visited by fear, but understand that it's just there to visit. You are allowed to go, okay, it's time for you to leave now. It's time for you to go. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, saith the Lord in Isaiah 41. Verse 10, what we are called to do is to have faith in what God has said to us, what our Heavenly Father has said to us. We must have faith in his word, faith in his promises. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have to believe that God has given us a spirit that has the power to overcome fear, that he has given us a love, a perfect love that casts out fear and a sound mind so that fear doesn't threaten or torture our mind. Because fear can torture our minds, can it not? Oh man, fear comes upon us and all of a sudden we have knots in our stomach. It affects us physically. It wears us down. It causes us to become weary, discouraged. When when I'm afraid, I become agitated, frustrated. I snap because of fear. Fear can affect me. It tortures the mind. Fear can be stronger than coffee and keeping you up all night as you're just thinking about what may happen, what's going to happen, and what if this happens, what if this doesn't happen, and it just haunts us. So the Lord has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. All of those things overcomes fear. All of those things. Now this word fear, Greek word delia, which means timidity, which is why a lot of people interpret, you know, 2 Timothy 1.7, the Lord has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity. This word fear comes from the Greek word delos, which means dread and faithless. And that's the reason why the polar opposite of faith is fear. Being controlled by fear, allowing fear to take root in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, will cause you to dread and to become faithless. George Mueller said, faith ends where worry begins, and worry ends where faith begins. And if there was anyone that had to have faith, if there was anyone that had perfect excuse or reasons to fear how to provide for his orphans, kids that he loved, it was George Mueller. In fact, when you read his book, he's known as the man of faith because he prayed for everything. He had made a vow to the Lord. He would never ask man for anything, but in everything he would ask his heavenly father in prayer. And there are journals that he kept, records that he kept of prayer requests and prayers answered. He was a man of faith. If anyone had reason to worry, it would be him. But he says, faith ends where worry begins and worry ends where faith begins. Uh, Fear can cause us to be timid. Fear can cause us to be afraid to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fear can cause us to be timid, to stand up for what's right 
and to declare what's right and to declare Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, to declare that only through Christ can one be saved and only through Jesus. Fear can cause us to be timid in our representation of Jesus Christ, our walk with Christ, living for him, proclaiming his promises and living by his word. Fear can cause us to dread everything. Politics, persecution, demonic activity, the person next to you. We can dread everything. But fear is caused because of faithlessness. And so if there's any of you here tonight, you're, man, you're just bound by fear right now. It's because you're lacking faith. You have misplaced your faith. You have taken your faith off of God, your eyes off of God, and you've allowed fear to come in and take residence in your life. And you need to kick fear out. Kick it out. Let it not take root. Let it not take residence. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, we've got to believe who God is. We got to believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him for fear causes us to reduce the size of God. That's the danger with fear. It causes us to reduce the size of God. And oftentimes what we do is we increase the size of the problem. We increase ourselves. Well, fine, then I'll take control. I'll handle it. I'll just do it. I'll get it done. And we move God out of the way and we just take over. We oversize ourselves, supersize ourselves. Fear causes us to reduce the size of God. So what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say to the mom, to the dad, who was afraid because death had come upon their child? Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. That's a hardcore situation right there a parent dealing with a child that just passed away afraid terrified what a horrendous situation they come to Jesus and Jesus tells them do not be afraid only believe in other words do not be afraid but have faith so what must we have faith in the Lord is my shepherd see if fear reduces the size of God then what fear does is it reduces what verse 1 of Psalm 23 says, that the Lord is my shepherd. First of all, before we could say that he is my shepherd, we have to understand who we are. And we have to come to grips with who we are. And we need to be humble because of who we are. Before a man can truly say the Lord is my shepherd, he must first feel himself to be a sheep by nature. For he cannot know that God is the shepherd unless he feels in himself that he has the nature of a sheep. He must relate to the sheep in its foolishness, its dependency, and in the warped nature of its will. So obviously, it's not necessarily a compliment. Being called a raccoon would have been a more complimentary thing than sheep because at least raccoons, you don't mess with raccoons. If you guys have ever watched the movie Elf, you don't hug (laughs) raccoons because they're dangerous. You don't just go up to a raccoon, even though they look cute, and go, come here. Do you need a hug? You don't do that. Raccoons are dangerous, and they're dirty, but at least that would have been more complimentary, at least in a tough guy sort of sense, than a sheep. Because obviously, according to Spurgeon, they're foolish, they're dependent, and then the warped nature of its will. Listen, I can totally concur with that. There's a warped nature within me. It's weird how warped I am. It's sad how warped. It's scary how warped I am. And in reality, humanity, right? All of us, we're all warped. We're all weird and warped. We're all foolish. And the truth of the matter is, we are not independent. And sometimes our arrogance leads us to believe that we are independent, but we're not. We are to be dependent. So again, admitting that we are like sheep, this is what this commentator said, a sheep, saith Aristotle, is a foolish and sluggish creature, at test of anything to wander, though it feel no want and unablest to return, 
a sheep can make no shift to save itself from tempests or inundation. And there it stands and will perish if not driven away by the shepherd. Sheep are so dumb. They're so weak that they would just stand there as the tempest approaches and die unless the shepherd comes and saves them. Holy smokes. And it's crazy because there are people like that. They'll stay in their messed up situation, never turning to God and thinking that it's just going to work out or they're going to figure it out or they're just kind of used to it. You know what? My situation is what it is and I'm just mi vida loca kind of a thing and I'm just going to roll with it. And, and, you know, but the truth of the matter is, I mean, even Aristotle back then recognized sheep are dumb creatures. So I must believe that I am sheep. But I also must believe that God is my shepherd. I must believe that God in his nature is a shepherd. And here David uses the most intimate metaphor thus far in the Psalms. Up to Psalms 23, David has used rock, shield, deliverer, king. Not necessarily personal, you could be under someone's kingship and not have a relationship with that king. You could be delivered by someone and never have a relationship with that person. But here, all of a sudden, there's relationship. All of a sudden, it gets personal. All of a sudden, in Psalm 23, he says, my God is my shepherd. For a shepherd lives with his flock and is everything to it, a guide, a physician, and a protector. And so in Psalm 23, for the first time, we see a more intimate, personal relationship with God. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. This is who our God is. This is the God of the Old Testament. You know, some people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament was super judgmental and mean. Uh, No, he wasn't. Even from back then, he always desired to have a relationship with us, a close relationship where he gathers us in his arms and to his heart, his bosom. That's close. That's right here. Bring him or bring us to his heart and then to gently lead those who are with young. Hey, parents, we love our children. We probably fear more for our children and their future than we do for our own selves because we've made it. But what about them? Are they going to make it? What is life going to be like when they're older? And our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the Lord tarries. But even then, you could say, but the Lord is a shepherd and he will gently lead those who are with young. The shepherd knows that the sheep that have their young, that the sheep love their young. And so he's going to love the young too. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's going to take into consideration your cares, your interests, the fact that you love your children, the fact that you love people that you know, friends, family, that you know. He's going to take that into consideration as he leads you. Parents, be encouraged by this verse. Grandparents, be encouraged by this verse. For you are like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer, literally superintendent of your soul. That's awesome. We were all leading astray, walking away like normal sheep. And then here comes the shepherd rescuing us, bringing us back. Like it says in Isaiah 40, taking us up by his arm and bringing us to his bosom overseer and superintendent of our souls. Did you know that? Did you know that that's what God wants? He wants to be the superintendent of your soul. He wants to clean. He wants to be like the janitor in your life. He wants to be the the, the person that fixes whatever is broken in your life. This is what God desires to be in all of us. Understand that when we say God is my shepherd, you have to realize that God stooped down for us. For in Israel, as in other ancient societies, a shepherd's work was considered the lowest of all works. If a family needed a shepherd, it was always the youngest son, like David, who got this unpleasant assignment. 
And if you guys know the story about how David got chosen to be the king, he wasn't even in the lineup because he was the youngest and he was shepherding. And his father, Jesse, decided not to even bring him to the lineup as Samuel came to figure out who the Lord had called to be the next king of Israel. And so after all of the other sons were rejected, Samuel goes up to Jesse and goes, is there another son? Are, are these all that are here? And, and the dad almost flippantly says, well, I mean, there's y- youngster. Uh, there's David, but he, he's a youngster, and he's a kid, basically, and, and he's shepherding sheep. He's dirty. <laughs> he stinks. Yeah, we, there's another son. We'll bring him over. And sure enough, as he was brought before Samuel, the Lord said, I've chosen him. I've chosen David. Jehovah has chosen to be our shepherd, David says. The great God of the universe has stooped to take just such care of you and me. How much does God love me? That much. Willing to be our shepherd, to take the lowest task ever so that you and I can be saved and have a relationship with him. We are his sheep. Spurgeon said, a sheep is an object of property, not a wild animal. Its owner sets great store by it, and frequently it is bought with a great price. It is well to know, as certainly as David did, that we belong to the Lord. There is a noble tone of confidence about this sentence. There is no if nor but nor even I hope so, but he says the Lord is my shepherd. Often bought at a great price. We're not just animals. We're property to him. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. At a great price, we were bought. At a great price, we became his sheep. At a great price, he became our shepherd. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. Again, we see relationship. Jesus didn't die just so that we could be saved. Jesus died so that we could have relationship with him. What what Jesus desires, what our shepherd desires, is that we know him, for he wants to know us, that we know each other. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is what it literally physically looked like when Jesus became a shepherd. When he was willing to stoop down to become our shepherd. That's what it looked like. He became like the lowest. He became bondservant. He became humble and obedient even to the point of crucifixion so that we might be saved. God is my shepherd. Now, the sweetest word of the whole is that monosyllable, my. He does not say, the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large and leadeth forth the multitude as his flock. But the Lord is my shepherd. If he be a shepherd to no one else, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, and preserves me. So if there's anyone here, may you've been haunted by fear. You must believe that God is your shepherd. And as your shepherd, he cares for you and he watches over you, and he will preserve you. You must believe that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must believe that God is my shepherd, that he is your shepherd. And as our shepherd, David goes on to say, I shall not want, meaning two things. The first thing is, I have all that I need. Jesus said, what's the point of gaining the whole world but lose your soul? Better to have nothing but to save your soul. Amen? So in reality, by the fact that we're saved, we have everything that we need. Salvation. So therefore, I'm forgiven. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm forgiven. 
It also means I've decided to not desire more than what the Lord, my shepherd, gives. In other words, I'm content. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm content. Think about it. Fear comes because of discontentment. Fear comes because the fear of not being saved. But when David says, God is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is saying, I am forgiven, and I have everything that I need. I'm content. Oh, if we who are born again can know those two things forever, I'm forgiven and I'm content. Oh, man. Oh, man. What faith we could have. A person that knows that they're forgiven, a person that is content, is a person with mighty, mighty faith. And so when he says, I shall not want, this is what he's declaring. Brothers and sisters, please, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. We're forgiven. Let us be content in salvation. Amen? Amen. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides still waters. I love this. He makes me to lie down. Sheep are very fearful animals and will not lie down unless they feel totally secure. Any disturbance or any intruder or stranger scare them. Stranger danger, and they, they're just fearful. They, they are. They're very fearful, timid type creatures. But the fact that our shepherd can cause us to lie down, to go against all of that, and be able to feel secure and not be afraid of the strangers around us or even the strange things around us, amen? Because there's a lot of strange things going on and not being afraid or terrified of that and being able to still lie down. Sheep do not lie down easily and will not unless four conditions are met. Because they're timid, they will not lie down if they are afraid. Because they are social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. Did you know that? If flies or parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. Finally, if sheep are anxious about food or hungry, they will not lie down. Rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with fear, friction, flies, and famine. These are the things that the Lord deals with, that he's willing to deal with if we let him be our shepherd. What did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Maybe you're heavy laden with conviction or condemnation. Maybe you're heavy laden with problems and tribulations or oppression, persecution from the enemy, spiritual warfare. Maybe you're just heavy laden with guilt or sin. Taking it too far, it's become this thing. Maybe you're heavy laden with debt. Maybe you're heavy laden with, I'll fill in the blank. Whatever you're heavy laden with, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. It's the same thing that David is saying here in Psalm 23. He causes me to lie down. You lie down because you get to rest. When you take a nap, you take a nap standing. It's kind of weird. And lay down, make ourselves as super comfortable as possible so we could rest. Green pastures. This speaks of the abundant rest and provision that God gives to his people. And that's why he is called Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide rest and he will provide provision. What do you need? You need wisdom? What do you need? You need faith? What do you need? Assurance? What do you need? Baptism of the Holy Spirit? What do you need? Direction? Confirmation? What do you need? Favor? The Lord will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. He causes me to lie down on green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. Sheep are afraid of fast flowing streams or rivers. Why? It's too much commotion. It's too fast. Too much noise. Us people can be like that. Dude, things are just spiraling out of control. There's just so much going on. I can't even concentrate. My mind is everywhere. It's all over the place. I'm just stressed out of my mind right now. It's moving too fast. Life is moving too fast. Things are happening too fast. I I, I don't even have time to keep up. I'm overwhelmed. Sheep. 
They're afraid of fast flowing streams or rivers, things that causes loud noises, too much you know, uh, stimulation, overstimulated, stressed out, but yet still waters are soothing and calming. And what's the concept behind that? What is God saying that he gives? What is David saying that he found with God? That God will give you comfort and peace. He will give us comfort and peace in the midst of all of the noise that's happening around us as life is just moving so fast. We're already talking about February. In our pastor's meeting today, we're talking about the things coming up in February. And Pastor Steve's like, man, we're already talking about February. Like, it's already January 15th, 16th? What day is it today? Already. Already. Things are just moving fast. The older I get, the faster I get. The faster life goes. Or maybe I'm just forgetting stuff. I don't know. Things are happening to me, by the way, as I'm getting older. Some of you are like, finally, I told you, remember? (laughs) Remember when you were 23 and you thought you were a whippersnapper? I told you, just wait till you're 41. And when you're 41, your life just falls apart. Welcome to the rest of your life. (laughs) I was talking to Brother Chris. He's like, dude, just wait till you're 61. I'm like, brother, I hope that the Lord comes before then. He's like, me too. I pray that for you too, brother. You don't have to live. (laughs) I think that's, I don't know. I don't know what I'm, you know what, let's move on. He leads me besides the still waters. What did Jesus say? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Again, see that troubled fear? Peace I give to you so that all of the troubles around you and the fear doesn't take over you. But in order for us for, in order for this to come true in our lives, we have to believe that our shepherd gives us peace. We have to believe that with our shepherd there is peace. We must obey him when he says, do not be troubled nor be afraid. Receive the peace that I give you. Don't go looking for peace in the world. Don't go look for things out in the world that you think will bring you peace. No, 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 no. Go after my peace and I will give you peace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. I love that. First of all, I need mercy, amen? And in mercy comes comfort. I need to be comforted. And as we go through whatever tribulation, the Lord will comfort us in all our tribulation. What did Jesus say? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In Christ, we will find rest for our souls. Verse three, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. This concept of he restores my soul means this, that God refreshes his people with his quiet voice and gentle touch. When you read in verse two about lying down in still waters. We're talking about tranquility. We're talking about gentle. We're almost talking about whisperings. And so what the Lord is saying is, I will restore your soul. What David is saying, God restored my soul. And he did it with this quiet voice, and he did it with the gentle touch. So a quiet voice reminded me of the story, Elijah. And he said, go out. This is God talking to Elijah. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. It's been windy these past couple of days, right? It is loud. Pastor David was saying that he thought his house was going to fall down because of the noises that the wind was making. And I almost corrected him and said, really, bro? 
Do you really think that a 30 mile an hour wind is gonna bring down your house? Can I teach you a little bit something about hurricanes and the power of wind? But I did it. I didn't do that, I didn't say that. I just let it roll, okay? But the point of the matter is, I saw trees doing this, and I was afraid that some trees were gonna topple over. As a matter of fact, on my way to church, my neighbor's tree, part of it fell down right on the street. Wind can be powerful, and it can be loud, and it can be dangerous, it can be scary. Santa Ana winds, we, we battle with that here, especially in L.A. and in the deserts. And truck drivers, man, they got to deal with that all of the time. Wind can be ferocious, and it can be powerful. And same with an earthquake. Last night I was thinking about that. Man, we haven't had a big one in a long time. That is not good. We're probably going to have a big one soon. I don't know. Just some happy thoughts for you. Hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The Lord is our shepherd. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the big one. <laughs> Woo! But an earthquake can be loud and gnarly. I remember when I was a kid in L.A., uh, 1987, I believe, when the earthquake happened back then. It was a 6.1 or something small like that compared to the ones we've had lately. And um, I was so afraid that I went into shock. And I, I, didn't, I couldn't snap out of it. My mom noticed that I was just weird. Like, I was like, it was like, I was like shell shocked. And I was just kind of, I was like seven or eight years old. I don't know how old I was, but I was young. And it scared me so much, the noise and the shaking and everything that happened. It affected me so much that I, I just wasn't myself. My mom said it was like, you, like I fell down and hit my head so hard that I was walking with a concussion. That's how I was acting. And I had to actually go to the doctor and get medicine and get treated for that. And ever since then, I've always had this weird apprehension towards earthquakes. Any kind of shaking, I'm like, you know, anything. Just because of, of my first experience with an earthquake, it's scary and it's loud. And then fire. Man, this last fire season, horrible. You hear about the things that are happening, in, that, that happened in paradise and the stuff they're still dealing with in paradise and how ferocious that fire was. We were just talking about that today. How incredibly powerful that fire was. And so here God reveals himself to Elijah. Wind, earthquake, fire. Powerful, loud, but the Lord was not in that. Where was the Lord at? Small, still, quiet. The Lord doesn't want to yell at us. He doesn't want to rebuke us and go off on us. He's not lording it over us. He wants to talk to us gently. Come to me for I am gently lowly of heart, meaning I'm humble. You don't have to be afraid of me. I'm approachable. I'm approachable. Come to me. I'm not going to go off on you. Let me comfort you with my words. He restores my soul. So tonight... Let us ask the Lord to restore our soul. Next Wednesday, God willing, we'll finish the rest of the psalm. And I want to encourage you guys to read the rest of the psalm and just get yourself acquainted with it. Notice the difference. Notice how it changes in verses 4, 5, and 6, how it changes. How, the, how David changes his approach to God. So Father, we come before you.